Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It is Friday, guys. If you have a day job, then you get to hang out and not uh, hang out with us, man. It's the weekend time. And uh, since you're not going to be going on, you're not loading in on a gig, then you're going to hang out with uh, Mr. Carmine Rojas and I, and we're going to have a good time. We're going to celebrate a little bit of uh, the silver linings that we can find during this time. This is going to be fun, you guys. I cannot wait to share some stories. Um, before I get started, let me thank my sponsors at Five Star Guitars incredible guitar shop based in Beaverton, Oregon. If you're not in Oregon, I just got to tell you, and you guys might already know this, Carmine, if you don't know this, there's no size sales tax in Oregon. So you can take your big fat stimulus check and all of oh, those great. royalty, yeah, <laughs> all those royalty checks, man. Um, and uh, they got not a lot those. of, a, a lot of, a couple of pennies. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they might have some picks that they can sell you. They've got uh, a great selection of guitars. They do repairs there and they do lessons with crazy badass guitarists like Jennifer Batten. So she just finished her guitar cloud symposium. Sounded like it was successful. She's going to do another one in October. So call up Five Star Guitars or go to www.fivestarguitars.com. Find some guitars, get your guitars repaired get a lesson booked with Jennifer, then book the Guitar Cloud Symposium. And then my job is done, man. I've already done all my work here and it's just Maybe time for fun. Maybe go to the beach. Maybe go to the beach because you have a beautiful beach. Oregon yeah. has a good beach, but you guys have the real beach. And we'll talk about some of that, man. Oh, you know, this weekend is the time. So let's get into this, man. Ladies and gentlemen, this dude has a pedigree that I can't, there's, I can't even do it in a full hour to tell you what this guy's done. Uh, as far as I know, he's not incarcerated at this time. He's, uh, he's, um, He's done everything from Bowie to LaBelle to freaking Rod Stewart, man. This guy, he's done it all. Uh, there's a lot of history. What's that, my friend? I tried to. Yeah, well, gotta be everywhere. you've got a lot of fans and they want to know a bunch of stuff. But man, I'm just so grateful yeah. to get to see you now, man. I've heard so much wonderful things about you. So with no further ado, please welcome Carmine Rojas. Thank you for being on Alexis Live, man. Hello, everyone, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, yeah, man. We, uh, you know, um, Robert Weatherby's already there. You got people already jumping in the chat, which is kind of nice to see. I, uh, I was going to say, um, this conversation really sort of stemmed for me uh, from so many stories from Eddie Martinez. Uh, Eddie is one of my favorite people on the planet. I've done a ton of gigs with him here in Portland. Um, he even did a solo album too. Beautiful what's that? solo album. Please oh, that. my God. That solo record. The new one, Akasua, or Akosua, I, 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 however you pronounce it. Uh, you, you got Tal Bergman and um, and Eddie on that thing. Oh, the right. We got a few people. Yeah, it's, it's a really great. Eddie is such an awesome writer. Awesome. Yeah. Writer. Just, just, it's just, it's, it's great for bass players, for drummers. It's so musical. You just kind of flow into the. It's perfect. Road, it's the perfect road trip album. I'm telling you, if you're going to the beach, that's what you do. You grab the new Eddie Martinez album, you throw it on, uh, wait till it's nighttime because it's perfect under the lights, man. I love the record. Rogue yeah. Chimps is the uh, Rogue Chimps is the one that you want to drive fast on, you know. So, Rogue Chimps, yeah. I, I missed you guys when you were playing in Portland because I had a gig out of town. But um, no, I'm I hopeful. There. Tal was there. Tal played. But you didn't do that gig. No, no, because I was I was doing another gig somewhere else. Of course you were. Of course. Well, yeah. See, yeah, then I, I can. I would have been there, but I was definitely somewhere else. Yeah, I, uh, it's a it's a smoking band. We're going to talk about that band. We're going to talk about the album, Eddie Martinez connection to you. This is what I got to say. Anybody out there that's watching this that does not know Eddie Martinez personally, there's not there's no greater soul and spirit on this planet than Eddie Martinez. He's not only got the greatest tone of any guitarist I've ever met, uh, and his feel is incredible, but his spirit is so pure. I love that man. He yeah. says the same thing about you. And when I started watching your social media posts, man, I got the same vibe. You are so full of positive spirit. Yeah. You, you know what, man? I mean, I, um, I have to say the stereotype about New Yorkers having this pretentious attitude, right? Where they're difficult to work with and they're assholes that doesn't apply to you guys at all. No, so I, I think it's just, just people who, uh, who are insecure themselves and don't yeah. know how to deal with that kind of situation. Because yes, we're strong because when we're you know coming out of Brooklyn or the Bronx or Queens, you have to be you have to have to have something, you have to be confident to get out of there in the first okay. place. Especially where we come from, you know, out of our Puerto Rican neighborhoods, you know, because we were we were always told we're never gonna amount to anything. And that kind of that kind of shit stays in your head for look for a minute until you you start educating yourself what's outside behind the doors and stuff like that. And 
the way we got out was listening to all the rock stuff and going to the film where he's looking, you know, going to see Traffic, Jets Will Tall, Jimi Hendrix, mixing that with the R&B and Latin roots. And that's how we got out by being, by having a, by being versatile. That music, was your ticket. You know, music, yeah, uh, ticket out. Well, you, let's talk about the maybe just prior to that, right? So Eddie yeah. gave me his background, the early days, right? Family stuff, like a whole bunch of siblings in one little little tiny apartment. What, what was your family like? Um, just as far as we small, nothing like Eddie. Eddie was like a like a tribe. Right. Yeah. He had his <laughs> own, own crib. You know. He had his own baseball team. <laughs> Thanksgiving was like always, like every day was like Thanksgiving. Like, yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Christmas. There was, a lot, there was a lot of a lot of brothers. One sister, I think, it was and right. you know, a lot of brothers. Mom and dad were absolutely awesome um, kids, and you know it's just. Uh, but it was it was the same. It's the same constant feel and the same passion. You know, growing up Latin, Puerto okay. Rican, we're all very much, very much the same. You know, it doesn't sure. matter we're different household. The same thing goes down: rice and beans, some chicken. You know. Yeah. Um, but but family meals were really important. The cultural sort of yeah. um, you you maintained a lot of the culture. Like uh, how how musical was your family? Not much. My dad, who I never lived with, uh, was kind of a shower singer. So he was singing <laughs> the old Cuban and Puerto Rican uh, salsa singers. Okay. In the fifties, um, and there was a few songs that I can remember that, that I actually still remember to this day, which I can't think of it right now. Um, that he would sing, going like, "Wow, it's a beautiful song." Never realized late years later that I actually be playing it with uh, Stella Cruz or somebody, you know. Okay, yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, where, where, where did your musical influence come from? The beginnings were again uh, salsa, Latin, you know, like a Ray Barreto, a Tito Puente. Oh yeah. Uh, so like, hearing it, uh, yeah, what made you want to play? Well, that didn't that didn't come to later on until uh, I think I think a lot of it was to do with. I mean, I felt it, you know how you feel the stuff, but I never really actually picked up an instrument until years later. Uh, when I started listening to Ray Barreto mixing African, because in Puerto Rico, you're, you're, you're a combination. You're yeah. a Taino Indians. First, you're Indians before Columbus came over. Right. So they, yeah, that was already discovered. Wait, really? Uh, no, kids. <laughs> I'm sorry. All of the conversation. Yeah. They brought over slaves. And uh, the sailors on the boats were um, Italian, Armenians, Arabs, combination. So they okay. blended into the, the cultures that we had in Puerto Rico. They blended with the Indians and brought syphilis and everything else. But we don't want to get into that. <laughs> That's not uh, a good influence for sure. No, no, no. Columbus, Columbus is not going down well in my book. Right. And a lot of people. But um, growing up listening to the um, Latin R&B and soul, like Motown and Stax or whatever, that kind of music always had a feel of soul to it. You and there was always some sort of African rhythm behind it, whether okay. it's Brave, you know, a combination, whether it's Brazilian, Africa, there's always something African behind all of it, even even straight up rock and roll from the 50s. Big time, yeah. Uh, but when the English invasion came, that was like, whoa, what's going on over there, you know? And it was on the radio mixing together, like, you know, you had um, Frank Sinatra and then Black Savage. You would, you would hear all the stuff at the same time, AM radio. And to us, it was just music. Yeah. You know, just a different feel and different... The clave was in a different place. <laughs> and, 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 and no rules, right? I mean, at that point, there were no, no rules. rules. All right. Everything was, you know, four seasons. You know, Jimi Hendrix. It's like, yeah. what, you know, what the hell's going on? But uh, as we got older and got braver to go down down to Manhattan, go to like the Fulmore East and stuff like that, and, much circus, and got to see those bands live, that really opened us up. Going, wow, oh, you can really blend all that stuff. Because we already had it in, in our hearts. We just yeah. had to find a way to bring it out. But those roots, a, early roots, you know, for me, for bass, for, you know, like James Jameson, for the army oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, um, I was, I was, I was Andy Gonzalez. I think about it. bass, Latin bass, you know, and um, Frazier from Free, you know, Jack oh, Bruce, yeah. you know, and you know Hendrix when he would play bass a certain way. Chris Squire was a big influence. I remember on. hearing that about you. I remember hearing yeah. you say that when you I, finally saw Chris Squire live for the first time, and you said, "Wait." How is it that was, sound coming out of there? Yeah, it was like a wreck. Well, first time hearing that rattle sound with the piano yeah. was uh, Ron Wood when he was Jeff Beck group. Right. And then I'm going, what? I'm wondering, what, what's all that top end? Where's the bass? And I'm looking at this guy going, he's playing guitar because he's playing with a pick. Yeah. With a telly bass. And I went, wow, that's so fucking cool. You know? Yeah. And uh, Woody and um, what's the name from The Who? Um, Ant Whistle. Yes. Yeah. And Paul McCartney. 
Oh, yeah. Drum, you know, doing other kind of stuff. That sound with the pick was really unique and I wanted to figure it out and learn it. Okay, so uh, had you started playing with fingers first? And you, fingers and, first, fingers yeah. first. Pick didn't come to later on because I, I just, it didn't feel natural yet. Sure, yeah. And I had to find a way to make the pick sound like, like fingers. Yeah. It took me a while, but I finally figured it out years later after working with a band called Nectar years later. You know, okay. a, a German prog band, German Yeah. English. And I got to play keyboards and bass pedals and rattle with the pick. I'm going, okay. You know, yeah. This, okay, I'm, I'm starting to learn some stuff when I left America. I, I got to learn all that stuff later on. That, and you, if know, you guys listening to the Let's Dance album, that whole album was done with a pick. The you know, pick, but it was done with a pick. Man, it's I got to tell you, there's, uh, I would love those stories about you doing the Bowie stuff, the Let's Dance, and that record. And like when you first got the session gig, right? When you're coming in to do China Girl. Yeah. It's crazy, man. So that was under my thumb. That was the reference that you got. I, back in my head, I heard a few days before on AM radio, it was one speaker, you know, Mono. Yeah. It was under my thumb, which I liked. I love the song. So, you know, the, the, the a few years. And then there was, there was a vibraphone, which I didn't hear before. Da 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 da. Bun, yeah. Bun. Da, 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 And it was the same chord changes like E, D, C, but it was like two bars a piece. You know? Okay. And the China Girl was two bars, but they were like one bar piece. I'm thinking same kind of chord changes, you know, and I never, and I never heard the original Iggy Pop's version. So I'm going, maybe I can figure out that love with that line is, but I couldn't fucking remember the line. Uh, yeah, there's no I YouTube then, man. So you yeah, had to, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I, had, so I just made up a, like a, like a rhyme, da, 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 da you know, a child's line, and that's how I came up with the bass line, listening, being inspired by the vibe part that uh, Brian Jones played. That's crazy, that man. Vibraphone. And, 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 like, and you weren't even in the band yet? You were just hired for the session? No, we were just hired for the session, which we were not aware that we were doing the session for David. In the first oh, place. really? It was a, it was kept a, a secret, a hush-hush secret. And were you we supposed were, to be kind of like ghost players for it then? No, we were just we were friends of Nal Rogers. And oh. I think David at the time, through another conversation, wanted urban guys. Okay. He really wanted session players because you, sure. know, you know he wanted kids that were just still wild enough or urban players where he could still move us around and control us because some session guys sometimes you can't move them around. Right, they're so stuck in their. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not a Tony Levin or whatever. You know, there's a few. Who are just yeah. Wide open, and David knows how to. David knows how, he's a great casting director. He knows how to put stuff together. But Nile gave us there was a list of bass players and drummers. Okay. And what showed up was Omar Key, myself, and we all played together with LaBelle. Oh. So we were like, you know, you know, walk in there and there's this guy with a hat on. And I thought I was in the wrong session because I was kind of looked in there and I'm laughing in my head thinking, it looks like some big old David Bowie looking kind of a guy. He, oh. I walked out and got called back in from an assistant engineer. And he says, hey, Karma, the, the session you do is going to be in this room. I said, oh, cool, cool. I said, uh, who's the guy? Looks like a looks like a Bowie. Yeah. And he said, that's David Bowie. And I looked around. I went, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> it was a true story. I was goofing. There's a real guy. So I didn't I didn't know how to approach him. I didn't you know, I wasn't sure about so Chrissy, you know, bow down or you know, or yell from a distance or wave. Yeah. But he came up to he came up to you and he shook your hand and uh pleasure meeting you or whatever. And I'm first thing came out of my mouth, my mouth was, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we gotta work on some demos, some tracks, or whatever. I said, we are. And I then Omar King walks in. I went, he looks, and we're going, uh, wow. You know, and you like, would... here, it was four of us in the room. It was oh. really Niles, Omar, and myself, and, and Rob Sabino on keyboards. So it was really minimal. And being a Bowie fan, you know, and seeing them in 76 and 74, Diamond Dogs tour. Oh, and, you did. And the, white, and the White Light tour, the white, yeah. white, white, very German looking kind of thing. In 76, uh, with Adrian Ballou. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, and always Carlos Alamo was always there. Um, it was very strange. It was just kind of, because I know that I know that stuff. But yeah. He, he never repeats himself. Right. Yeah. Stylistically, he, he thing, evolved every record. Right. But he knows how to wave, move, move people around. And we were just, we just did what we did, you know, just kind of played. You know, Let's Dance is basically a groove, like, like a gap band groove, a big right. stuff, call it. You know, I think the original was in, B flat, and it would go back and forth. I, I I just snuck the other notes in there to give it much more of a flow. You know, it, it stayed in B flat, but I put the F sharp in it just to give it another color. Oh yeah, man, that's, yeah, just, that's just, a little Carmine touch. 
yeah, yeah, just give it another R&B color to it. So, uh, and nobody said anything. So I figured, okay, that's staying. China go riff. I mean, uh, yeah, same thing going. Okay, well, I guess, I guess they like that, you know. Oh man, you know, and stuff on Criminal World, which is which was was actually an overdub with Tony Thompson playing drums. Awesome. And Tony oh. was part of the bell too. Yeah, man. So it was it was all family week, but uh. It's crazy. Like yeah. when I think about you and your rhythm sections, man, you know, just the cats you've played with. I, I told Eddie that I said, you know, I don't know that I could even fit in the same room with cats like that. Not because of ego, because it's just like so fat, you know, that, that you, uh, it wouldn't work right. the bass thing wouldn't work right unless you right. have a great drummer. None yeah. of it in any band, none of the stuff would really, if, if you some, if your foundation and cement's not right. Yeah. not going to happen. The floor is it's, it's not, it's going to, the floor is going to fall apart. You gotta have a great, great, great rhythm section. It's always been it's an old school style. You know that. Yeah. You know, being a drummer. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you know, one on one. I um I lost your video signal for a second. Oh, just for a second. So I just uh, but I but what it did was it allowed me to look around your room a little bit. And you and I talked oh. about this before we went live. <laughs> Can you give us a little tour of these records, man? This is so cool. Uh, well, that's, yeah. This is I have a, this is a small room. My mom's got the big room. Let me see if I can move this stuff around. Yes. So moves it. That's part of, that's just basically Julian Lennon. Uh, oops. Did we lose somebody? Oh, we lost you. There you are. Okay, your audio froze for just a sec. There we go. Okay, so behind me is probably yep. uh, uh, Julian Lennon, Bowie, Tina Turner, um, Rod Stewart, uh, more Bowie stuff, Bon <sighs> Lots on this side. Let me see, hopefully the audio doesn't go. More stuff on this side. Look at that, more man. Stuart, more Rod Stewart stuff. Oh, that's so uh, nice. And then there's more stuff in the corner. There's posters and uh, uh, yeah. Australian artists and from uh, European artists because I spend more time in Europe. Oops, sorry about that, guys. Got my, got my coconut in there. Oh, uh, yeah, man. You, uh, um, you were mentioned Europe, too. is a big deal for you. So you live or yeah. you spend quite a bit of time over there. you got yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, I moved in 1980 with the, with the British German band, Nectar. Okay. It really got me into a whole prog and you know, listening to Gong, listening to General Giant. It got me more involved. King, well, I was already a King Crimson fan from back okay. then. But it got me more into that kind of playing to pick and sure. you know, probably more keyboards and chord things and bass movements against the chords and how the bass can change one note and dominate the whole the whole chart. Basically, you know, it's just one movement and it just takes over the whole thing. Um, and that's you know, where I met Steve Winwood and a bunch of people in London. Oh, really? Over there? Okay. Before, before I came to America. Wow. Before I came back to America in 82, went back with Nona Hendrix. And that's when all everything's followed through in the 80s where a lot of the English bands like the Stones, Steve Winwood, Joe Cocker, um, um, in excess, a lot of bands were coming to New York to, to, to have New York players involved. Right. Rock, so, rock so, music, you know, it's all. Yeah, music. Brian Ferry. Yeah, you know, Brian Ferry, yeah. You've got a, so many people from Europe that have jumped in on the chat. You know, you've got people from Holland that are saying hi. You've got uh, all these. That's my second home. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. You know, I really, truly do feel a real connection to the Netherlands as well, buddy. Yeah. I, yeah, you know, special about that place. it really is. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I just unearthed a bunch of like footage from, you know, we, I would do a bunch of like Belgium, you know, Netherlands tour, yeah. Germany things. And, after, yeah, all of it. But we'd be based in the center and like in Enschede and then we'd yeah. just, you know, in the little cat cottage and then we'd bump out to do all the perimeter, perimeter, yeah. perimeter gigs. And the people there are still to this day, I mean, just some of my favorite humans on the planet. Oh, they, they you've, you know? you've toured all over the world, man. I mean, isn't it amazing that the gigs are one thing, right? The right. gigs and the bands and the hang with the crew and all those things are really, really special. Venues are special. But when you make connections with people in all those places, you remember, I, I was talking to Todd Zuckerman yesterday, right? He's yeah. been doing the sticks yeah. and fair. We were talking about how a meal that you might have in Munich stays with you longer than a particular gig because yeah. the meal that you had with that person, you know, whoever it was that you're hanging with, those little things, man, are like these, these magical moments that it's I feel- Prepared with love. A yeah. lot of it's prepared with love because you can taste it. Yeah. You can feel it. Uh, mannerism where the wine is where you know people are sharing people are, it's, it's open communication and they're sharing everything with you which yeah is beautiful and it really very grateful to be a part of that and in my head you know like the, like i said the europeans i have a special love because i spent lived there twice yeah um these last few years i spent a lot of time in the netherlands 
Oh, did you? Okay. There. And they're just like like old hippies that never grew up. Right. Yeah. You know, the scholars, the teachers, the journalists, and they still got long hair. I mean, this one guy who's 79 still goes to conscious and still stands. Oh, I'm yeah. Standing. He's still standing there. Don't you love that, man? Yeah. I, you know, man, I just, um, I was in, I was in time. Yeah. Th- Once you do something special, they don't forget you. Sorry. That's the truth. I, I was, you know, it had nothing to do with really the musical end of things, but I was over in Thailand last year, um, spent a couple of weeks there. I'd never been. And I went and I met a ton of great musicians, uh, both Thai and expats. Right. And then, but I went and I got this, uh, a tour of these, the temples with this retired monk. And he, he just, he, you know, and he, it was amazing to me how these people study their whole lives to become unconditionally kind. You know, and I think about Europe, man, there are so many people I've met that are like that. They just, they're willing to put you up in their house. They'll feed you a meal. They'll come, they'll drive so many countries away to come see you play. Completely. And they're just it, really loyal that way because yeah. they, because you've given stuff back to them. You give them, you're giving them heart and soul back to them. And they, you know, you know, human beings are a particular breed. Yeah. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're very destructive. Right. Uh, I mean, sabotaging the planet. I mean, we're the ones making it worse for everything right. else. Animals are cool. The grass is great. Whatever, whatever this planet has to give you, it's absolutely awesome. We're the fuck ups. If we're not, if we don't keep control of what we need to do and be careful and being be, and give back, like we were saying earlier, you know, paying it forward. Doubt for just a second, buddy. That's why. No, 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 that's okay, because uh, I, I got a lot of uh, great passion and energy from what you were just saying there. So, um, It's where but, it starts, yeah. It, it, um, you know, it's interesting, right? Because we all know people that have been in the industry a long time that they get complacent. They're on the road, and they're there to do a job, and you see them on yeah. stage, yeah. and they, they don't venture out and make these connections with people. And they, yeah. when they're on stage, they're not giving back either. Uh, I do know that about you peripherally just because of the people you played with and a lot of friends of mine that have met you through, you know, their gigs with Earl Slick or, you know, like right. Eddie or, or, you know, Stevie Salas. I mean, all these guys, I've never heard one bad thing about you, which is really nice, man. <laughs> <laughs> Even bullshit, Stevie. You bullshit, except for Stevie, right? You yeah. bullshit me one or two times and I'm going to come at you and shut you down for a minute. It's yeah, like, well, there's, no, there's no reason for it, you know? Yeah, no, we're that's it. We're out there being grateful, giving back love, whatever. And when yeah. you come up with that going, all right, I'm going to have to shut your ass down. You yeah. know? <laughs> but what we have, we have a gift that we, we, we have to give back. I mean, you, you, you know, again, paying it forward. You really have to give it back to people who are trying to put their lives together, whether they're musicians or not. And any sort of spiritual or insight of love or something that can help yeah. that person who is unknown to us, yeah, get him off his feet. We're doing our job. Yeah, and that's what we have to. That's what we have to do together as a, as a unit. But we're, but we're not going to because human beings don't play very well together. That's, that's you know, uh, and it, it, you're right. I mean, it's it maybe human nature to be destructive and a little yeah. less. You're but born pretty wild until yeah. until you're educated. So you're born <laughs> wide open. I mean, you imagine Genghis Khan is a fucking kid. Sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. look what he turned into. Go. Where's your mother? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, how were you raised? What's this all about, man? Yeah. What, what's it, wow. You, you got a really bad attitude, brother. <laughs> but but you, you but you know, I, I think about like you and Eddie and some of the cats that were grew up in Brooklyn yeah. and the Bronx, and obviously, man, I, some folks, some parents did a. Know. They did a great job of really raising dignity, dignified, respectful young men. Uh, you know, somebody actually speaking of the young men, uh, somebody uh, Mingo Toll says, "Ask Carmine about." Hey. He says, "Ask ask uh, you about sly practicing at your house in Brooklyn in the early days." Oh, man, yeah, that, that was the second band I was in. We were a band called the the Bankheads. There was a guy Felix and Herbie, and they had they, that was really my first time actually physically playing bass. They had a precision bass. And I physically had to learn uh, Born to be Wild and Evil Ways and stuff like that. And my hand, you know, it was the first time I had to physically playing it. So okay. thinking about it, and it was with them and Mingo, because he was back, we all grew up together in Brooklyn. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mingo's a bad dude, too. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, he was, that was a, that's, a, that's actually when I first physically started actually picking it up and was scared of shit because it just felt like I couldn't do it. And I gave it. I dro- I gave it up three times. The bass. I just kind of really. Like, yeah. Until I stopped trying hard. Okay. 
sometimes, you know, if you try too hard, you're, I guess you're, it doesn't lock in. But when I stop trying hard, then things start coming in and things made a little more sense. Depends on the part. Yeah. I, I yeah. wanted to play, you know, leading, I'm a Beatles song, I'm going to play everything, but I, had to, I didn't have the proper education yet. And that I would have to take my time to learn. But I put all my R&B Latin stuff together, mixed with the English rock stuff. And then, you know, hopefully it would take me out of Brooklyn. Yeah. Or not. That was the hope. I don't know. Did you and Eddie, I mean, did you think, yeah, this is what I want, man. I, I want to go to the next level. I need to get out of Brooklyn. I want to go to, I want to be internationally. It was, right. it was either that or end up being, you know, we, we, we were just coming out of Vietnam. A lot of our guys never made it back home. Right. So we were still in line, you know, my number was too high. Um, and I wasn't sure whether I was going to go that route for, because I never finished high school. Okay. But to get formal education to get my high school degree or end up being a junkie, which is very real. Right. Or marrying a situation that you're going to be completely depressed and never know the possibility to, if you were able to achieve, you know, to go to, to make it across that line. You know, because you, you just didn't know. You mentioned, man. You, you mentioned he, like uh, junkie being a real serious yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, we we all know people that have gone down that road, man, and you know, like rest their not souls. That, not that long ago, too. I mean, they were still going through it, surprisingly, and only one or two made out of, out of you know so many. But it's, Did, it's a sad situation when you let yourself go uh, because of your beliefs or the situation around you that you put yourself in. Yeah. You know, and it's it, not easy. Did you, you know, ever? Did you ever delve into that realm? And I okay, I, I, was, I was afraid of needles. So yeah. right away, I was right. I was in, I was in good, good standing. Yeah. I hate needles. To this day, I hate needles. Yeah, so not, I knew I was going to be a junkie. Um, but I dabbled in pretty much everything you could think of. Yeah. You know, we had around back in the '60s. Sure. Quality was better too. I wouldn't. Do it, <laughs> I wouldn't do it, try to shit now. Forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. You always. You know. You always wonder what you know, what sticks with people? I mean, like with some people that in the 60s, 70s, whatever, today, you know, the stuff that, that uh, people get into, whether it be yeah. through peer pressure or they feel like, I'm amazed now that a lot of the 80s bands are making this resurgence, right? So I've been playing with the Flock of Seagulls. We've been doing yeah. bigger bigger shows than I've ever done in my life, man. All the original guys? Uh, the original singer. The original the singer. Guy, the guy with the hair. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, he's he's That's got your he's got he's got your hairstyle now actually, and so I do mine like him. But um, but when we do those gigs and we go out with a lot of bands from the era, there's been a huge resurgence for appreciation yeah. for that era. Right. But the, some of the guys that just reformed are kind of in the mindset of thinking, well, we're going to relive the '80s, oh, yeah. all things that go yeah. along with it, and there's no way you can do that yeah. these days, man. You know, but. You're going backwards. Again, that's Big your time. insecurity is you go backwards. But yeah. the, the key thing, and you know this, and your peeps know this, uh, addictive personality. Yeah. If you have it, it's a problem. Big time. Yeah. Uh, and control, guilty. Yeah. If, if you don't control that, I mean, that's the little monster that just keeps feeding and keeps feeding, going, no, it's going to be okay. You can do one more. You know? Right. Yeah. I and, quit anytime I want. Yeah. And I used to hate, you know, back in the day when I used to, you know, we all yeah. used to fight pretty good. I hated sunlight, so I always try to get home or to the back of the hotel before the light would come up, sun would come up. So I always try to get back in the dark, back on the sheets or whatever. But uh, like this dark you know, background. The, but having addictive personality, which I don't have, a lot of my Good. friends have, that's I've noticed that's the trigger of having to fight twice as much to not be caught in it. Big time, and yeah, I, man. I rescued a lot of people. In my I rescued many people for a long time, for a lot of years, and I'll still do it to this day. If I see someone needs to help, yeah, man, and I know them or not, you know, just it's just, and it's something you do. I get it, you give them back. You know what? The fact that you say that says a lot about your character. You know, I mean, because a lot of people are impatient, you know, and they're really self-centered. So I'm not surprised to hear you say it because everything I've heard about you, you know, is that uh, you're very unselfish. You're very generous. You know, in, in both time and energy. And, and I conduct over many times, but you know what? I still about get the dust off me and keep going, keep getting yeah. up. I can't, it's, I just, I think, I, I think that's a lot to do with my grandmother, but I, my mom, um, they just, it was just, you know, love is strong. You know, the something about the passion, the heart, when you see people crying, it's, it's, it's emotional. Yeah. You know, when you play certain parts of music, whether it's classical or blues or R&B, whatever, there's certain songs that touch you. Uh, certain songs bring back old childhood memories. Yeah. And that's the stuff you have to try to stay in touch with. Sure. That stuff is superficial. Yeah. And and again, growing up like you did, like all of us did, 
there's you know there's strippers there's blow there's all this shit in front of you going and you don't realize that has nothing to do with music but you got to go through the shit to find out yeah you know, and some some guys are just really smart stay over go around it a lot of us are not that smart so we end up diving into it and getting caught up in all the crap in it but if you catch yourself in time and love what you do and respect yeah. it, you know and, and be grateful well, I mean, like, I'm glad, glad I have a gig. I, I should be grateful. I should really be thinking more of that and push yourself on those thoughts and hang with people who are going the same direction. Yeah, man. I mean, that is a huge part of it, right? Like the people yeah. you surround yourself with, you it's know, a, it's important. Did you have anybody early on, any like sort of mentors or anybody that kind of helped guide you? If it wasn't an addictive thing, but, but maybe, you know, like you grew up in Brooklyn, right? You know, there's a, there's, you know, it's easy to yeah. get into a lot of trouble there. I, th- I think a lot of it was, you know, um, I was never, I was always a shy guy. I was never the guy in the front. Yeah. I was always the guy in the second, which ended up, I ended up being a great band leader because of that. I could see what's going on thinking, I'm not going to go to that guy. That guy's going to go steal a car. <laughs> I'll, wait, I'll wait for him over here. <laughs> I watch the cops come around, which I have done. Really? And here comes a car going, oh man, Ralphie, what are you doing? Um. Uh, Mingo knows Ralphie. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, you just have to, um, yeah, you just, you just, when you're young, I mean, seriously, you know, you got to dive into the deep end to yeah. know, to know your, 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 I guess your, your amount, your element, or where you fit and how much energy you have to go through it. And, and a lot of it, you have to really educate in the balance of, uh, I'm sorry, social skills and your talent. The two are really important. Oh yeah. Great player, but be an asshole. Y- yeah. Like, you can balance the two. You know, I'm never going to ever think I'm a great player. I just know I do the job that I need to do and find a way to make that person in front of me comfortable and to take care of him. And I've okay. always been that kind of guy where who's ever in the front, take care of him like a soldier, you know, Yeah. and never leave a man behind. That's so great, man. I, I love the fit. Yeah. The metaphor is great. Um, you know, your gratitude is, is another thing, man, that we talked about before we went online. Um, I noticed that the people that are really happy and able to kind of stru- uh, survive like the pandemic right now are the people that can find some sense of gratitude, even with what we're going through, you know? Um, and a lot of that has to do with like rituals, you know, like traditions and that kind of thing. Right. You know, um, the, um, if you've got like a daily ritual where you wake up, like for me, I, I got a gratitude list that I start to fill out and look at, okay, I right, need to. Beautiful, right. But I and, do you have anything like that? Yeah, I get, I get up very quiet and go, my wife sleeps. You know, because she wakes up later on. I always get up early in the morning. I go out, get the <laughs> simple steps, but I get the backyard together. Yeah. So when she wakes up, she sees it's all, you know, it's all organized. Do the dishes, go grab the dog, go for a walk, keep everything quiet and peaceful. Yeah. Don't put the news on. Not yet. Don't put the news on. Yeah. That, that's a horrible now, way to wake I, up. I, I put on Channel 200 in the, in the Pacific, on the Pacific side where you, know, you have CNN and you have uh, Fox and you have. Uh, MS, you know, and BBC, which I love very much. Yeah. I get to hear about international stuff. Sure. I can share what's going on in America. But I get every, the point is I get up quiet. Nice. And do everything quiet without talking and just trying to uh, zen into the day. Yeah. And thank God, you know, I, I like a sunny experience in California uh, and then sit in the backyard and it's quiet. Yeah. And everybody else wakes up. That's gorgeous, man. Walk, go walk. Um, do you I do the same thing when you're on the road? Yeah, in my hotel room. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I can stay in my room all day. I don't have to go out. Yeah. You know? And the only time I go out is when I if, I, if it's a new church or a new area I have been to, which is pretty rare, I'll get to, um, the guy who's taking care of us in whatever country we're in. Yeah. And early in the morning, I have a map already what I want to go see, the temples, yeah. the museums. I do that every morning, go go out for the first six hours, then come back. I got to see the city before That's Saturday. Great. Yeah, man. I, I still do that. I still do that. I love arch- the cities with architectures and stuff. I love that. I love yeah. being in the desert in Dubai. You know, I love being in Ireland, seeing the ocean. You know, you it's just certain places uh, that touch you. Traveling around the world, it's it's helpful. It shows who you are. You know, you know, physically. I mean, that's another thing that we can all really celebrate gratitude, right? I mean, like how lucky and fortunate, I guess, yeah. like luck is, is a weird thing for me. I, I try, I, I have a hard time. Fortunate is a good word. Luck is, fortunate. Sure luck, yeah, fortunate. Yeah, fortunate. Yeah. You know, because I mean, a lot of this luck or whatever, I mean, the opportunities you have, you've made a lot of those things happen, you know, and, and a lot of those you things. Right at the right time. 
that is very helpful. But if you, if, you know, you were in that place and you had not paid your dues, you hadn't prepared yeah, yeah. yourself, you uh, didn't, you know, you talked about attitude and if yeah. you didn't have the attitude that was, be, was able to hang with somebody being in that right place, wouldn't have mattered. Right. So it's no, no, all, if you have the ability to, to match what you're trying to go after. And it's always great to go after shit that looks like it's too far away, but go yeah. after it anyway, because yeah. those guys on top, you'll learn a lot from them. That's you know, don't, don't cheat yourself. Really We're, good stuff that's awkward to you, art to you, and just kind of like I'm gonna go see what it's like and just give, give, me, give me an example. One of those for you, man. What was one that just really challenged you? Well, the weird thing was was like growing up doing R&B Latin, and then there was uh, King Crimson. So oh. Like what the hell? You know, besides Beatles stuff, King Crimson and Gong, uh, right. General Ty going. What the like? Whoa, 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 wait a minute, you know. Different Clap, language. Stuff like that. Hendrix, seeing Hendrix live and seeing that rawness, it, it was just like, wow, you can do anything. Yeah. You really could do anything. So it wasn't about color too, or if you were Puerto Rican or Italian or whatever. Sure. It's just the ability, but you have to be ready. You have to prepare yourself and be ready when it was easier. I don't know about, I don't know what's happening now in the world with musicians coming up, but we had to really learn our craft. Yeah, we really had to play, and we really had to be on the road and play all those shitholes, you know, all the places level wise. And I got to fortunately got to do all of them from from a shit club all the way to a fucking Wembley Stadium, you know. Yeah, man, or, you have three hundred thousand people in Copacabana Beach, you know, for New Year's with Rod Stewart. So, you know, oh yeah, man. Stuff that your eyes, you have to be a pigeon to really see if you get your eyes adjusted for it. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, you, and you know, like some of those huge ones, you can't see past the first twenty rows yeah. anyway, right? So it just looks like a backdrop. You I know, mean, makes sense. It's, it's strictly business, you know. But, but the sound, yeah, that's the thing that, that gets me. And the, huge. When when the the crowd, even with in ears, when the crowd singing your song is louder than what you can oh, hear in the ears, God, yeah, yeah, I get goosebumps with those, man. Yeah, but yeah. you know, you mentioned. There's rare, it's rare to find a place in the world that you haven't been. Do you have a place like there's is a few, there's a few places I haven't been? Yeah. I mean, we keep we I keep tackling with South Africa. Uh it's, it's been round three already. I'm ready for round four. Something always happens with South Africa, but I've been pretty much um pretty much around the planet where there's where there's have major concerts, also even small ones. Because I like I like theaters. Yeah. For me, my favorite are theaters and small arenas. Because you can theaters connect with people closer. Yeah, and the floor resonates beautifully. Oh, yeah. You know, those old English theaters, uh, the ones that haven't been burnt down from the war. Right. Uh, we have a couple in New York, like Town Hall, something called Carnegie Hall. Uh, the Fillmore had a great yeah. sound. But as a bass player and drummer, things that resonate with you is it's awesome. Yeah. Especially oh. as a bass player, because everything moves, you know? Yeah. Like listening to Humble Pie or something, you know, live at the Fillmore. Oh, it's a great album. <laughs> that really, you know, yeah, I just, I, it's just flashback to that going, watching, you know, Humble Pie live at the Fillmore and listening to that sound. Yeah. It's just big and majestic. And it's four guys, you know? Um, man, that those early days, you know, it's, yeah. it's funny because you think about how magical it is to listen to those things. You said, you know, I don't know what it's like for kids growing up as musicians these days because yeah. we had to practice our craft. Well, I think, you know, I've got two kids, uh, 18 to 21. A 21 year old really got a lot of his sort of musical education from YouTube, right? I mean, that's where a lot of kids get it. And and they get, they might perfect their craft in some way. They'll put their close to 10,000 hours in playing by themselves. And, right. the, and there really is a disconnect from people because of like the way that technology is, right? So people aren't getting together and jamming in garages really, as much yeah. as they were, you know? I mean, they, and with people, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that, because yeah. the interacting with people is really where I think that's where the disconnects kind of happen now. Exactly. And that's and, the only way to learn something by people saying, hey, no, can you do it this way? Or learning interpretations and, yeah. and not being, not copying an attitude about it. somebody saying, man, you suck. Yeah. And just, get better at it or whatever it is, you know, but you got to play with people. That's just you, you do. do. And, and really, and you talked about uh, the, the Everest, you know, taking something that's really up and, yeah. and seemingly a lot impossible. Complicated stuff that, you know, like, like really, for me as a kid, uh, there was, a, oh, there was something else. It was Mick Carnes. It's in a band called Japan. Okay. And he was such an awkward, Percy Jones and Mick Carver, Karn were really angular, different kinds of players. And I was like, my, how do you approach, what do you eat in the morning for that? <laughs> you know, I'm kind of wondering. What do you eat in the morning for that? <laughs> yeah, what do you eat in the morning for that? So how do you, get, do you walk sideways? I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's so I venture into it. 
Okay. You have, you have to venture into all those kind of things. You know, you might not like it in the end, but at least when you venture, you find something out. That yeah. You can, like ammo for your, you know, ammo for your gun belt. You're educating like, yourself too about you the language. You have to. That's you know, why I, I agree with the young kids with the YouTube stuff. Yeah. I picked up a lot of stuff. You know, thank God for YouTube. Yeah. But educational stuff. It's just, it's so much stuff there. You just have to, you have to like fly around left and right all day. Yeah, but can you, if we had had it early on, can you imagine? Because oh, you can you can see people's technical skills going through the yeah. roof now, right? Because they're exponentially. But yeah. but you know, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. When I see you know a five year old drummer that is just playing circles around most adults I know, I think okay, well something's either in the water or technology's yeah. helping that. But <laughs> what, what do they eat? <laughs> yeah, what do they eat in the morning? You know, but you uh, you know, like even musicians, musical styles. One of my favorite stories about you, buddy, is um. When you talked about Stevie Ray coming into the studio oh. and you thought, wait a minute, like Texas blues and this kind of stuff, right? And yeah. David, but, you saw it. Bowie yeah. can see an image wise and he completely turns some stuff around. And all he had to do is sing to the track and he links it. And having originally it was supposed to be Albert King. Yeah. So you, you got the best of Albert King. Right. Hanks. right. It's the best of all that stuff. But when he played, it's like, you know, he looked kind of kind of hokey. You know, yeah. from, from, from Texas going, right. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be kind of, you know, I guess it'll be okay. And I walked out the room and he was warming up and I'm a big Albert King fan. I'm yeah. a big Holy Wolf Albert King fan. And I went, holy shit, what a great vibrato. Cause I you never heard hear that, that. Before, you know, the vibrato, yeah. the tone. And years later, and I re, you know, we ended up being friends and I ended up picking up his guitar. It was like bridge cables. Oh my God, really? I couldn't believe he was bending and being so lyrical and so just flowing. And these things were like bridge cables. Wow. I think that maybe Eddie will, he'll correct it, uh, gauge 11 or 12 or something. Okay. It was something ridiculous going, I said, this is, did you still live on the Brooklyn Bridge or something? <laughs> you know, he started laughing, but he, he was just so fluid. And he was a real natural and he was the real deal. Man, that was an unfortunate loss, you know, really was, man. I, yeah. you know, I'm just, uh, you know, you've had a lot of loss, buddy, in your life. I know, man, people that have been close to you all throughout yeah. the business. It, and for, for me, when I see that happening with Eddie, um, he has so much reverence for these players, you know, that he's played with. And it's amazing to hear him talk about Tony Thompson, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and Robert, man. I mean, you know, Robert yeah. Palmer, man. He just, and when I hear his Great. reverence, I yeah. think rather than lament the fact that they're gone, I celebrate the fact that he had an opportunity to yeah. serve on this planet with those guys and make we're leaving, music. We're leaving, we're leaving stuff behind that we still can appreciate 10 years from now. Yeah. And that's oh. a hard thing for us now as, as artists and for yourself too, it's finding those kind of really great gems of gigs, you know, and I'll, I'll you know, I won't do nothing for months. And I, if, if I see a gem, then I'm going to go for it because it just, I, it, 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 what it does is, it puts you in a place with the other gems and you can, you, you, you know, it's going to be something beautiful. Yeah. You know, like I did with Bonamassa, same thing with him. Oh, Doing yeah. Him was like, okay, here's a guy, guitar style, because I like cream. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's got the, he wasn't flashy, but right. was never flashy. He's still to this day, he's not flashy, but he plays a certain way and it's loud and it's beautiful. If you can stand mm -hmm. in front of his amps and the tone is gorgeous. And he has, he has a spirit to fly and with him and I, you know, we have a, like a different relationship where I would move root notes around and he would just fly around. Really? So he, he, he loved the challenge. So when yeah. I joined Bonamassa, it was like being back playing for an English and American band wow. and a great blues band and a great prog band. It was a combination of all that stuff because live it was, it was, it was like, yeah, you know, it's just. It's I felt, gotta feel you know, great. Yeah, and you have to feel like you're 16 again. So yeah. I, I always try to find those kind of gigs. They're very difficult. Very hard. Sometimes some of them don't pay any, but it doesn't yeah. matter. It's about this feeling that getting that spirit again. How did that gig come about for you? Um, it was a combination between him doing a solo album. It was Jason Bonham. It was because That's of right. Jason Bonham, because I was friends with Jason, and um, Kevin Shirley, and a friend of mine named Chris. Okay. And they, they somehow passed the message around that I was available because I actually wasn't doing anything. I really? Mean, 2003 or whatever, there was a break where I moved to Vegas because uh, the, the industry was was really acting very strange. I right. just put thoughts to it. And it was just, it was perfect timing for me to go back to basic good blues. 
Yeah. Where I could I could open it up and change and use my arrangements in my head where I didn't have to stay order notes and you know stay pounding like the old guys, which is great. But I wanted to I wanted to venture somewhere else with it. And that's why someone made a comment before to you about mountain time. Yeah. So I'll call mountain time, uh, where he was supposed to be asking me a question. And if he's around, the reason why mountain time sounds the way it does, if you hear the original, there's really no bass in it. So I, I took advantage of all the where the chords would go and move the root notes around. And mountain time ended up being this just beautiful piece of music in the end. And, it, and it was, it's a part of me. So it's nice to leave that kind of stuff behind. You know, so 10 years from now, I can go back, wow. And 10 years from now, from 2009, Roll Up a Hall, I can still listen to it going, wow, I see what I was trying to do. You know, it's just nice to leave something behind as a musician. Like I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not a jock or best story. I'm not any of those kind of guys. I'm just me. You know what? I love that you say that. I Do you have children? No, I have a little puppy girl. Oh, yeah. Well, you, but I know how close you are with family, right? And yeah. so when you talked about leaving stuff behind, man, uh, I mean, you, yeah. you have legacy, buddy. I mean, you really do. Whether you think, you know, yeah, I'm no Jocko Pastorius. You know, unfortunately, Jocko's legacy was really tainted by the end for him, you know? And his, you know, what he contributed musically, of course, is just, oh, there's, you know, massive. it's uncontested. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Massive. But uh, again, what I massive. see, oh, I'm sorry. Addictive personality. I lost you. Froze up for a sec. Sorry. Sorry. Addictive personality. Jocko had it pretty bad. He should never. He started off very clean, no drugs, until yeah. he started zipping around to it. Lost control over it. Yeah. Eventually, in time, sure, he took over. And it's it's it, it's it's a it, it's a drag, man, to see that really his legacy was tarnished, right? And uh, uh, what what I see uh, though, yeah, what I love is like I'm looking at your buddies that are tra- chatting, you know, on this thread. Uh, Mingo says, "Man," he said, "You're exactly the same. You haven't changed at all, <laughs> you know." And and that's a beautiful thing, right? Because um, not only do you leave the legacy of these great contributions to music, but everybody that I've talked to in the industry talks of, and they have reverence for you, for your attitude, for what you contribute and in, in spirit as well. And man, that's so rare. You know, I, you player. I, you know Don Kirkpatrick is, you know, I, I love him ah, to that too, man. You, and uh, he, ah. um, he, uh, you know, I was so grateful, man, that he kicked the cancer thing right after you left the rod gig. Right. And, Good, and yeah, yeah. scary stuff, man. But yeah. uh Oh, you know, and I just realized, yeah, you've got, I know, because I think the Rod connection with Don Kirkpatrick and Katya Reicherman, you got something happening with Katya too, right? I, I, I helped Katya get the gig. God, man, I, I adore her. We did a conversation recently and yeah. she she owes me a, a baked potato soon when I can get down there. Baked potato, yeah. At the baked potato, because you know what, man, believe it or not, I've never been there. Are you seriously? I've never been to the Big Potato. Small little, small little shit hole. I know. I watched. I've watched a thousand videos from there. You know, but um, you know the the Bonamassa thing. I saw clips, man. When you came through Portland, you were playing the Schnitzer, and all of a sudden, you guys bring Eddie Martinez up to do uh, further on down the road. You know, and I it's uh, I knew for him because he's so humble too, man. I knew like. I should tell you, and, and people, again, I asked if anybody in this chat knows who Eddie Martinez is. Uh, I was playing with Animotion for a long time, like 15 years plus. And that's how I knew Don Kirkpatrick, right? right? So when he was, you know, he'd do a couple of Animotion gigs and he'd go off and do a tour with Rod. Right, but, I remember that. But we did, uh, man, we did this gig with Frampton and uh, John Regan was on the gig um, and I was hanging out. I had just started playing with Jennifer Patton here as well. And I did a bunch of gigs with Eddie and we're hanging backstage. I just met Peter for the first time and and he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Portland. And John Regan said, oh, man, you might know my buddy, Eddie Martinez. And I go, of course, man, I play with Eddie. And he goes, you're shitting me. He said, Eddie's one of my favorite people. And then Frampton goes, wait, you know Eddie Martinez? I said, yeah, man, I play music with him. And I, I do this Animotion gig and I've been playing with Frampton, I mean, with uh, with Eddie and then Jennifer Batten. And he goes, wait, what? And, and I said, yeah. Oop, I, lost, I just lost you. Oop, come back. I see you, but I can't hear you. Not nothing yet. Element of. There you go. The, oh, did you lose me for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like on the road, like um, Eddie talks about, not just Eddie, but um, uh, they talk about the camaraderie that you bring, you know, and uh, it's so much family, right? So, do you think that the Puerto Rican background and the, the growing up in uh, in the, yeah. the in Brooklyn kind of helped bring family vibe from your 
home, yeah. you know, to, yeah. to, to uh, for to, sure. Because if you're Latin, whether you're Italian yeah. or, or Spanish, you end up, you end up inviting people you don't even know. Like, Oh, are you hungry? You know, you, the door is always open when you're a kid, there was people come up, people, family, people knocking on the door, you know, you open the door and there's your uncle Pepe or somebody, you know, uh, and that kind of stuff you take with you, which is okay. Yeah. So, when I'm on the road, being a music director or not, sure. he's always, we always have a crew. And with us in the band, Cacho Teo, we always, the girls would always go with us, all the crew guys would go with us. So whatever happened, we all get invited and we all hang all together. That's we cool. all have to work together. So again, I, I'm, I'm that, you know, well-rounded where it's really important to be a team player. Yeah. And you need to help up everyone so I can sound great too. Sure. You know, I'm being supportive. So we all end up supporting each other. So we all can sound great. Man, I, what was that? The family vibe was was the Bowie gig like that too as well? Yeah, all oh, big time with Tony. Yeah. It was just yeah. it was a comic event because Carlos yeah. Alamo was very funny. He was a music director for okay. uh, the Sears Moonlight tour and uh, the '87 with Peter Frampton uh, Glass Spider tour. Okay, he's he's just his smile was every day. Wow. He, so either you were smiling, having a good hang, or you don't hang out with us. Okay, and that was the rule. That's you know, so good, day, man. Be appreciative and be grateful for what's happening around you. And we're doing stadiums every night. Oh, you know, my God. Yeah. 59, 59 stadiums in a row. I mean, <laughs> you're leapfrogging with two different gears. You know, it's like, yeah. And you're looking around, and, you know, you're, you're in this league that's so up here, but you don't treat it like you're up here. You treat yeah. it like you're, you're, you're back in the neighborhood with your gang. The and hood. They loved it. David was really close kin to it because he loved that attitude and, and that, that closeness because he could run away from his own stuff and come into our camp and didn't disappear i wondered about that yeah, yeah I mean, david, we... david was very flexible very much like like very much like a chameleon um he was just really easy to maneuver you didn't have to try anything you yeah. know you look around you do you go in some place he's right there going i'm going with you uh, like okay yeah asshole when the big artist goes with it because people follow right we always had to, we, we always had to have plans and plots how to sneak out of the hotel we had we had maps set up you know strategy with the soldiers and you know how to get in how to get back how to sneak back in the hotel so we had all that kind of stuff going on which made it fun because the gigs after a while they do get and you do that many gigs whoops you're there i lost you you got me I got you there. No, no. There you are. Yeah, you know what, man? I lost your audio. And this is good because you were talking about sneaking out and how you... Uh, yeah, you we, buy had, we, we had to plan, you know, plan yeah. how to sneak out, sneak in, get in the car, uh, have a dummy. We would have a the limo would go out this way. We'd be in the van going out that way. Oh, really, man? So we, had, we have these maneuvers. It's, actually, there's a photograph of us uh, with Slick, uh, Carlos, myself, and David. And we're posing for the photographer, Dennis O'Regan before we jump into the van, because the limos oh. were taken off. So everybody would follow the limos, and then we get in the van, and David would jump in the car with us. That's he, so he cool. Never, he, was, he, never, he was never that kind of guy. Yeah. He, there he was, was the, very easy, very flexible, going, I'm going to get in you guys. He's like, no room. He'd lay over across us. Oh, my God. I love I, that. You know, it was, it was very that flexible and that genius about him, you know. And, and again, he was just a great casting director of people he would put around him. You know, I, you know, Gio Palato here is asking uh, oh, this right relationship now. between Carmine and the tour manager, Manny Kusters. Oh, Manny, the German. <laughs> Gio, great, great journalist. Okay. And, and, and boy, you know, like, Gio's got a whole bunch of comments in there, but he wanted to know about this relationship between you and this tour manager. Do you, uh, you have a good, uh, everything was good? Yeah, yeah. Manny, God bless him, you know. I just hope he's doing, he's doing, hopefully he's doing well. I mean, he was always our tour manager or our truck driver in Europe. Okay. He was the, he was the guy we go to and grabs and Manny, can you be a tour manager for this week? Can you drive a truck this week? Can you drive the van this week? He would do all of it because he's so good. And he's just a, another one with a special heart. Yeah. You know, from the sixties, another wow. guy. And he's just, he's just a heart of gold. I said, I want that guy on my team. We try to keep enough of those guys. Yeah. And Gio knows I miss Manny because you know, now we're, we're stuck. Here and we can't even leave the country because of the guy with the orange hair, you right. know, the rules that they're making over there. Um, yeah, it's it's just I miss him. 
Yeah, you man, know, you I know, miss Manny big time. <laughs> I've got some friends that are chiming in on here too. That it's over in Germany. My my pal Claudia, she's uh, she's wishing that I could jump over. And yeah, we're you know they don't want us over there right now. And I I get it, man. But yeah, I, get it, uh, I get it too. If we could do it together as a team, this yeah. country would just be one. Right. As Let's Americans, just, we can do this. We can actually yeah. get back to work sooner. Yeah. Not have to hassle with it or or battle because of wearing a mask is unconstitutional it's on america right. we're just protecting each other don't be so stupid i'm sorry <laughs> no you don't think that way but it really is to protect you and myself so we can get back to work sooner the you sooner know. we do this together as a team it's the only way it's going to work yeah uh, sooner we can get back to work yeah i, 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 I to go back to school i'm telling you man I, yeah I, I i really feel like the kids in our country are suffering the most right now right it, it, yeah. it's a new world for them it's a strange world for them because they're seeing the adults fucking it up. Yeah. No, but you're right though. I mean, like with, with my own kids, I always feel like I'm apologizing, you know, for the current state of things because I can't explain, I can't instill confidence for them. I can't say, hey man, everything's going to work out because. But keep saying it. It's, it's, well, good. it's healthy to keep saying it. And then as you're you, saying it, you find a way. And you will it. find a way. It, it, and part of it is this, I mean, communication and really yeah. uh, like us sticking together, you know, and, and you've got so many friends over in Europe and around the world. And I do the same thing. I try to, I communicate, miss- you know, and, and we, we all have to kind of lean on each other and this is the time to do it. I mean, the, this, planet, the whole yeah. planet needs to do this together. We yep. can get out of this thing together. We can and, for sure. Like in the band, we're, yeah. we're in bands. If we're, if we, if we sound organized, we sound together, we, we're going to sound great. When yeah. we sound we sound shitty when we're playing a part, you know, when everybody has their own little ego or whatever. Right. Yeah. It, but, it takes longer for the shit to come about. I've never seen it. About. Never seen a project with you that way. I was thinking about your style. Man. I worked hard on it. I, you, um, you know, you talked about having this sort of hodgepodge of influences, yeah. right? Where you, you grew up. Puerto, 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 yeah, Puerto, Puerto Rican smorgasbord. <laughs> Say that three times fast, man. You, uh, um, but you know, I, um, your playing is so rounded. You know, you've got a, a lilt and a bounce to it that is amazing to me, man. And a lot of them. Um, the swing. Yeah, uh, you do have. The rock stuff. You try do. To, try to make everything swing as much without, you know, still play it straight, like, especially with the rock stuff. Yeah. You can, you can alter it a little bit more, but it depends on the drummer and where the yeah. rock is. And yeah. try to always give it a little air, not, not, to, not to be so exact on it, because uh, it depends on the song. It depends on the order. Sure. Do you, do you like do, like if you got to go in and do a session and you show up and you have a brand new drummer that you've never played with before, um, is, is it intuitive enough for you to go, okay, I can already feel that this guy's a little behind the beat. So I'm just going to play on top just a little bit to round it out. And, right. You, you yeah. adapt to whatever it is. Cause I let them lead the way because in this kind of, whatever the kind of gig is, if it's a three piece yeah. band, it's different, but you know, you go into those kind of big session gigs and again, the drummer has to be the foundation and you got the singer and where the bass is going to be. And there's some drummers, um, where the foot is different from the snare. Yeah, for sure. Very, that's very strange. There are yeah. only a few, there are not many like that, but it's very hard for a bass to get my center yeah. and get the groove on because it's just, it just doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I, I sit and wait. I listen to what he's playing and you know, the, and I watch the hi-hat hand, Okay. how, how flexible and beautiful that is, how it swings yeah. and the snare hits or whatever. And again, yeah. it really depends on the song and how I'm gonna approach that song. And I, you know, I think about different bands. I think about I'm going to play Beatle-like mixed yeah. with me or whatever. Or depends on it. Really depends on the song. And I try to approach every project quite different, so it has a little bit of always has, always has me in it. You know, it, it sounds yeah. like somebody or it doesn't or, but it's always very solid. It could be minimalism. You know, it could be. It depends on on the song and the, on the artist. You know, it you, depends depends on a lot of things. Man, tell me about Tony Thompson's foot. Was oh, the like, foot. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I could be down that, in Brooklyn. I could still hear it in Manhattan on Queen. <laughs> in a sound check somewhere or a rehearsal. Yeah. yeah big foot. Even as like, like a kid with LaBelle days, uh, you know, 1975, he's, his foot was huge because he was a big Tony, he was a big um, uh, Tony Williams. Yeah. And yeah. Mom Vishnu. And this, at this point in time, when I met Tony, he was very much getting into Mom Vishnu and, uh, you know, Billy Cobb and yeah. Tony Williams was his. Because Tony Williams would mix the jazz with the rock really well. And Tony was right there doing it. But uh, as kids, he had a lot of passion. Yeah. He had abundance of passion. And you could feel it with the wind blowing, you know. 
uh, that, uh, you know, it's neat to see guys like you light up about him, you know, because I, I never got a chance to meet him. Love his playing so much. As a drummer, you know, I mean, guys know, right? Drummers know yeah. what, what a player he was, but he didn't get the recognition that he should have for his contribution to, you know, what, like, I and think. More, it, there was more to him that he let he let on for others to see because yeah. the Sheik thing doesn't really show his ability. He yeah. showed grooving, but when he would do it like a rock thing, or whatever, and um, when he would, the versatility of his was great, and people wouldn't let, wouldn't let him open up. So they he would, never really got into other bands. They, they would open up, but he could open up his chops, yeah, of rhythm stuff, because he he had the ability to do that. Yeah. But we get stuck listening to Sheik, which is always fantastic. Yeah. Uh, a couple of rock things, the, the Bowie Live album, which is great. What he does on Less Dance. Um, the LaBelle stuff, which I mean, <laughs> you know, a bunch of wild kids, big froze. Yeah, but I've seen some of those pictures with you and Eddie too, man. Eddie, Eddie, they look like kids. You, you can tell you've been playing, you can play too, man. You got some drumming in you, don't you? I love drummers. Uh, drummers and guitar players were always, but you can play. I know I can't, I, I, I could feel I could go because you just you had the mold oh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. dialed right there, man. Oh, you know, <laughs> the, the, double, the, the double bass drum, <laughs> <laughs> your drum, your air drum is on point, buddy. That's <laughs> good stuff, yeah. you know. Man, like you, you mentioned the LaBelle days. I was just going to say, uh, this, this is Eddie. Eddie sent me a couple notes, man, about uh, early days with LaBelle. So I was going to say, he said, all right, so Fort Worth, Texas or somewhere in New Mexico on tour with LaBelle in our youth many years ago, a club owner invited us to an after, to after a concert, oh, uh, after a concert, he left the club open after hours just for us. There was a bandstand and we jammed in full rock mode and all the gear just started to blow up. He said, we couldn't help it. Tony Thompson put a hole through the kick drum. The yeah. amps blew up. He said, it must have been the tequila and the rum and coke chasers, but everything disintegrated on stage. It smoked everywhere. I mean, we blew holes through everything because we were just, we were trying to do Robert Trower. We were doing all kinds of, all the rock stuff. Oh, and man. the gear did, just fell apart. <laughs> the drum kit and the amp, and you could hear it right before it sounds great, the amps, they blow. <laughs> you had like you were like some punk rock band walking in there to slay in this. We, you know, we were doing a Day of the Eagle, what I think was the song. Oh yeah, we were, we were we were doing that, or I remember doing that and doing a just a big old rock funk kind of a thing, like Bad Company or something, you know. Oh, but I remember afterwards, I think we were driving back home. And Eddie remembers this, and I remember Jose, Jose Rossi, and we got so toasty. That I had, we had to throw up. We had to like pull the car over. So I opened the door, and as I was really, you know, sorry, folks, let it go. go I fell out of the car, rolling down the hill. Oh, God. <laughs> you, you <in> Texas. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually fell out of the car because I pushed myself out to, to reach it, you know, oh, and I fell out of the car and rolled down the hill. Oh. <laughs> At least they stopped and picked you up again. Man. Oh, well, I, 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 all I could do is laugh. And I, I felt like I had tumbleweed all over me. And I had shit in my hair, my fro, oh. twigs later on, you know. That, that must have been a common occurrence. He said you guys were so hung over the next day after that thing that he said you had to sleep in the luggage rack inside the bus. Yeah, in the bus. That's, that's what, that was the only place you could stretch out long enough because the, the buses were like normal buses. Yeah. And he said, but right. you were you were ready for the, he said you were ready to hit the next day for the gig. You were, yeah. Always. That's always, that's always. We were always resourceful. We would be a mess, but we'd always be there for the gig. And whoever we were working for, we fought with them. You know, we like yeah. get in and make make them look good. Whoever's in front of us, we always we always worked hard to make them look good. That's why you're still getting the gigs, man. You know, the yeah. uh, I um and we'll talk about this gig coming up. But I was going to ask one other thing. He said uh, there was a recording session story where you guys were cutting tracks with Tina Turner live in the studio for Foreign Affair. He said uh, she was this force of nature, having the and having her sing while you guys were cutting tracks. He said one of his favorite memories playing with you. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah we were getting goosebumps, and we were funny because Dan Hartman produced was the producer. Really? Okay. He said, Don't ask her questions, you know, about the pad, about James Brown or Wilson oh. or stuff like that, because you can't let you can you, she won't stop talking about it. Oh, and so and we, we had to do the session. Curious to hear about about the Wilson Pickett story. Yeah. And, uh, we slip on in there and Tina was giving stories and we were like little kids listening to her because she was beautiful. And she yeah. would tell these stories about what's a prick and, you know, always carrying the gun, stupid gun of his. And, oh, right. And James Brown stories. And and we, we would sit there like kid and Dan Harmon walked in going, 
told you guys, you know, you know, because she won't stop talking. Oh yeah, you know, man. We, we, you know, we just wanted to corral in the corner before Don, Don, uh, Dan Harmon. God bless him, rest his soul. You, Matt, you, um, did you, did you actually end up playing with her on tour? You said no, just did a, just did the album, and okay. then uh, we did a video with her and David. Okay, and she came out and sang with us a few times, and then I've had a lot of friends play with her live. Okay, you know, which, which yeah. is Steve, uh, Steve, Steve Scales on percussion and on bass. Uh, very good friend of mine, bass. Um, it's funny, you, you had this, but it's the same again. The New York Gang, yeah, was part of something that was going out there. Amazing, so man! That, band, it, was some, it was someone from New York was in that band. Isn't that crazy? That I mean, yeah. you know, I, I joke about there being something in the water, but it really had to be like you know, it was hard living, right? I mean, you guys, it was hard living in Brooklyn and the Bronx in that time, and you know, you had to almost um, work extra hard, right, to be able yeah. to get. And we're still working extra. It's funny, we're, we're still treat our situation the same way we still work extra hard not as hard as we used to but yeah we still put that extra effort and looking for those gem projects which is are, are so much harder these days than it was back in the day uh no we put a lot of we put we put a lot of work in it and getting out of a neighborhood for anyone yeah. not an easy thing and then taking a gamble I, like i said now it's a whole different is the difference? I don't know how their kids are doing it. Well, but that's we, a thing. Yeah, we were you... in the deep end, and we, you know, either you lose yourself and never come back, or come back be somebody else. Yeah. Or come back be be successful because it doesn't always it doesn't always happen, and you have right. to really be on top of it, and you have to like kind of say, well, shit, it's not going to happen, and you just kind of try, try to push that second about past it, and and something may you know, and again, being visible. Yeah. Like your first thing, the ability and your social skills and being visible. Three things that are really yeah. important, like a pyramid. Uh, they're just really important all the way around. Man. So people can see you play and, and people can socialize, can hang out with you and um, be invisible. Try you know to. You know? This is such great education, man. If there are people really that are watching this thing, that are musicians that are thinking, you know, what's it going to take for me? Even there's no guarantee, of course. There's but never what. Guaranteed. But what you're ta- what you're saying right now is so valuable, and people oftentimes get one or two of those three. But if you can mask, if you can work work on the three, man, I mean, you're at least stacking the odds in your favor, right? If so you aim for one hundred, even if you get to sixty, you're doing great. Just that's right. That's good. You passed that, and you know you'll realize going, oh wow, I, I passed forty. That's good. Yeah, right, man. That's probably there's a scale. You just go past it, push for past it, and you realize you wake up and then go on. Oh, wait a minute. You're gonna be my, you're gonna be my personal trainer, man. I need this. This is good stuff. Hey, man, I want to ask you about this gig. Okay, can I can I share this poster? This is cool. So tomorrow gig, yeah. You got a gig tomorrow, man. This is awesome. Check this out. Yeah, yeah, man. So you got the detour, the music festival. It's a lot of us on this. Uh, it's a lot. I mean, it's a, I'm doing with uh, Macy Gray and Billy Gibbons tomorrow night and Pacific time, six o'clock and seven thirty. Okay. It and it looks like they can find out uh, there's, uh, I'm trying to move the link here. So they can go to Morrison Gal- Morrison Hotel Gallery.com. That's where they can uh, stream it YouTube. from. Right. They can go there. There's a, there's a YouTube link because it's going to go on all day. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, look at Ring, Ringo Starr, Macy Grace, Slash, David Johansson, Taylor Momsen. So they've got new, new, new pop stars. Yeah. Man, Cheap Big Trick. Trouble. Yeah. Look at this. Danny Warhol. Oh, there's Portlanders right in there. That's cool. I uh, so many Sean Lennon. Oh, you know what? And you did Julian, right? Yeah, I love I love Julian. It was in the beginning, help him, help him, uh, help him to get on to to. He, he was never. I mean, basically, it's just helping him get on stage and sing as a front artist, not as a guy playing behind keyboards. Really? That, okay. That I have to thank Phil Ramone for that. Producer Phil Ramone. He turned me on to. Uh, he got me to be on the first album, and I did the second one, but it was because of Phil Ramone saying, "I need you to." Watch this! Watch this kid. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I said, "What do you want me to do?" I said, babysit. Babysit. Basically, basically, babysit. Yeah. And show him how to how to be a front man. I said, well, "That's crazy." I said, "He's never really done it before." Love the first album. Going. Yeah. Okay, I'll put a team together. And yeah. I got allowed to put a team together, and we did it. We did it. And he was a natural. Really. Well, he, he didn't realize it, Julie. He was a natural. He just kind of flowed away from the keyboard and learned to be a front man. And he copied a lot of Phil Collins. That's how you got really? It. Yeah. 
but so you're proud to be a front man. Man, I, I have hopefully we have time to tell yeah. you the story. Um, this was in DC, Constitution Hall, Washington, DC, and he was performing, we were performing, <clears throat> and the um, the gear went out. Somehow the PA went out, or the gear went out. Okay. Oh, the the widgets went out. That's what it was. No and monitors, so no monitors. No monitors everywhere go shit. So most guys would panic and run off stage. At least yeah. What he did, he looked around, looked at me. I said, keep singing. It'll come back. Keep singing. So when he looked around and he, what he did, he followed where his voice was in the house. So he walked up to the front of the to front of the stage, which I was really impressed. Yeah. He there and you could hear the house system. So you could hear wow. his voice. And that, I'm thinking, wow, what a nice yeah. that, got, that stuff that comes with years and years of. Yeah. He had confidence because we were there for him. Yeah. And we, we rehearsed uh, him facing us the whole time. So okay. when he turned around, he knew his back was covered, which is important. You are a good soldier, man. You really, you know, that's that's part of the thing, man. You have this sort of that metaphor, you know, that you're just, you, no man lets, gets left behind. And you're, you know, you, um, and, you know, we, we partied hard together. We hung out great hard together. But it, when it came to showtime, it's a business. And we have to, we're there to detain. And his confidence level went to the roof, Julian. You still stay in touch? Always, always. I, would, I would imagine he's got to be indebted to you really for that support, you know, the belief. The first two, two major tours and the first two albums, you know, because then I had to go, this was uh, 85, 86, and 87, I had to go back with Bowie to do the Glass Spider tour. Had to, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we were called to bring the <laughs> back, you know. And David didn't want, didn't want too many new people. He just wanted to keep the same gang so we keep the same vibe. Yeah. And, you know, his thing, I was, I didn't want to interrupt that, man. I was just going to say, because I know that he was notorious for when he would change style from album to album, right? He would evolve musically. And then over, there were times where he'd just say, okay, I need a new band, right? And uh, Prince, Prince would do that same thing. You know, Prince would just go, okay, clean and house, new engineer, new girlfriend, new band, whatever, you know? And it's very strange how, how those artists do that, but they have a thing in their head. They see something, hear something. And if, if he's gone through a club one day, he sees a, like a really shitty band in the corner playing shitty, he says, I could do something with that. You know, he'll get those guys to come and play with him. Yeah. But it was really cool because he, he knows where the, those kids are trying to get to. Really? He did that to me when I was doing the last dance. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, what I was trying to figure out. And he just let me do what I do. And he just said, we'll keep all that stuff, you know? And just, I went, okay, you know, like, I wasn't sure. It's like this. This guy's up here to me. Yeah, right. Some of the gods up there going, "Why is he being so nice?" <laughs> yeah, well, you know, nice? <laughs> man, I I love the fact that you know you held that reverence to him, but he was just yeah. one of but, you. You've seen the extras episode, right, with uh, Bowie oh, and, and Richard? Oh my <laughs> humor dry. You know, and guys, Mighty Python. Those guys would come and hang out too. Really. They would come around. Eric, Eric Idle would come around all the time. No kidding. Uh, you just, you know, and you can see David. It, 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 he has the same comical sense, so he really fit with those guys really yeah. well. That uh, I, I would think that you know because he um, some people in, you know interpreted like this stoic sort of um, not morose or somber, but just uh, reserved and kind of guarded person. Yeah, sure. But maybe that's because those people just didn't get in close, huh? No, not close enough. But because yeah. once you know, I'm going. That's just David. Yeah, and he, and he he just morphs into just whatever it's around there, and he he always, he's always looking around for stuff. I mean, there's a moments at the hotel where there's a janitor or something. He'll go up and talk to him, find out what's going on, and you know why does this mop have this thing? What's that for? You know, <laughs> the guy got me freaking out thinking, who's this blonde hair looking thing? You know, not know who Bowie is. Yeah, or know who it is, and go, yeah, this is here, and you move this mechanism to this or whatever, and this is how you get that. He said, wow, it's cool. Humility. And he'd walk away. So humble. Yeah, and it was just, you see that going, that's why you have to be. Yeah. You know, so it made the gigs easier, you know, whatever we had to do. And he knew what he wanted. You know, he, he was never, he didn't flounder around. He was like, oh, okay, I want to, you know, let's see if we can get, let's see if we can get this to this point here. And then okay. we go and be on it. You know, it gives us, it gives us a platform and we get on it and then we can move to somewhere else. I love it, man. You know? That. You know, I, I just brought up Prince a little bit ago about changing bands. Did you ever play with Prince? No, no, we just kind of hung out. It's just, again, another guy who's, you know, you look at his height thinking, 
this little motherfucker's got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, he does, man. I, I he, he was like my favorite all time artist, honestly, man. Yeah, just for you would took he took us back to the R and B days where we grew up as kids. Yeah, every band he had was absolutely genius. For Big, sure, and songs. different, and everyone different, every style different. But I just thought I could totally see you playing with him. The well, way that you know you, you're, man. I don't know about the hours. I mean, the hours that we oh. keep a little bit different. You have to be on the beeper and. You know, right. One morning, we're going to go to this club and, you know, like, wait a minute, I just, I haven't slept for four days, you know? Right. We just did four hour show and he goes, yeah, yeah. but we had four hours more. We go somewhere else. That's we right. Him, you know, we saw him at a, at a stadium in Aust- in Budapest. And then later on, we saw him in the club. Yeah. Every night, man. Yeah. I, I, I've talked to a lot of friends that have played that gig, you know, and they said, yeah, it's a, uh, it's not something that I could have held on to for very long. You know, there's no yeah. way that your body can hold up or, or your brain, but it's right. amazing that he did as long as he did. He did, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. You're a, uh, man, I mean, you've had some legendary st- things too. I just, every time you bring up a story, I, I get to something else I think about. <laughs> you, you talk about Live Aid, man, how you had, you talk about crazy schedule. Yeah, it's funny because I was there, Eddie played Live Aid. I was there with Julian in case they, they, they were going to open up a slot for us. And, okay. Uh, in Philadelphia. So we were there watching the shows and hanging out at the hotels, but we never got to perform there. But uh, I've done Wimbley Stadium with Rod Stewart and Bowie. Well, last year. <laughs> you do Braille? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can do sign language. Uh, do you have me now? Yeah, I have you now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking, you know what? It wasn't Live Aid that I was thinking about. It was the Us Festival gig. Talk uh, about crazy schedule. You had to yeah. play like Budapest the next day? Well, we were, we were coming in. We played in south of France, refueled in Belgium, and then flew all the way to Los Angeles <sighs> to do the Us Festival, Us Festival the next day or that night. Yeah. Night. And then after the show, get to a small hotel, change clothes, eat food, get back on the plane and go back. Insane. Because you're right in the middle of the European tour, you close that festival. And so you just had a one a day off. You're like, all right, we're just going to go to LA. From it was, it was a purpose day off because it was a work. It was really we, we get in and get out. Yeah. Because we were just like I said, we were in the middle of a massive uh, European tour, stadium tour, God. and we were there to close the festival. That's incredible, man. Do, do you you know during those times was it so like? I guess, um, did it, I wasn't going to say it become mundane, but was, you've been doing it so hard, so many dates and so long that was it just like, okay, this is another day at the office, man. We're getting to do this thing. And, or did you think, you know, we're, this is probably not going to hold out for years, you know? No, 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 no. I think, I think each day, if I remember correctly, each day was, a uh, because it was a different venue. You were, yeah. a different place. you were in Gothenburg, you were in Stockholm or you were in Austria and it was just, the environment of all those different languages and foods and whatever, it, it made it interesting every, every gig. So it was always, the, 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 the set list might be the same pretty much. Yeah. Um, depends when, when we, whenever we went to the States, the set list was different or Canada or Japan. Sure. Uh, but it was never mundane. It was just like always an event and you were just happy to be there. Yeah, it's so and cool. Alamo, this is the Bowie gig. And, you know, the smile, that big old smile on his face, you had to go with him. Yeah. Uh, there's no way of going against it because you, you, you lose. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, sometimes you just get so burned, you know, yeah. physically. We did a lot of, uh, we did, um, um, I think it was, with, with David, we did 13 months. We did 12 months. The last two thing where we, it was over a year. Yeah. It, it lapped over, you know, we did, we, 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 we spent two birthdays. That's wow. How- that wore us out. That one, that one got to me because yeah. we were hanging a little bit too strong. Yeah. <laughs> too consistent. <laughs> we had to at least a week off somewhere. And it was impossible, but we got through it. Was Palmer playing drums during that time? It was uh, Tony Brock did the first half and then Dave Palmer did the second. Okay. Yeah, I love Dave, man. I, I just really enjoyed getting to know him too, man. Like, another another funny man. Yeah, another- man. Big time. I um you know, Carmine. I think I, I, it's funny because I was kind of thinking about talking to you about the chronological stuff and I bounced around so much. But one thing that's really consistent, man, is that um, everybody that's talked about knowing you back in the day and really what, you know, what Eddie told me about you, what Katya has said about you, what Don Kirkpatrick has said, uh, you know, I think 
when I, a lot of musicians, I ask if you could put together like the perfect band, right? Like your favorite musicians, right? You're like that guy, man, because you, you know, you've got all the fundamentals, but you just play what's appropriate for the tune. You're an easy hang. You're funny as hell. You seem like you've got uh, a, you know, a reverence for the craft as much as you do for your bandmates. And, and looking at what people are saying in this thread, you've maintained these friendships with people that are just, that's a gift, man. It's so cool to see you do this. You, um, just, you know, I, by you saying it and people reminding me, it's just, I have to remind myself sometimes. My girl does that to me all the time, you know, it's just, and my mom, you know, don't forget. Yeah. I give them a lot of credit, my girl and my mom, and, and now my little puppy girl, you know, look in her eyes, but uh, oh. you have to, yeah, it's, it's, I like being consistent in that way because yeah. it's natural for me. It's, 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 you know, and all I have to do is play and be in the right band with a right bunch of guys and I'll fit in anywhere, basically, yeah. you know, but you have to be respectful. Sure. What I do, I have to be respectful of what you do. And we have to take care of the guy who hired us and make sure, make him look like a king. Make Man. him make everyone sound like a king. And yeah. that's important. That's old school. Yeah. The front guy. Wherever he goes, we go with him. Yeah. You know, so, like it's, it's no singer thing you know with the singer you forget the second verse or go in and straight to the chorus we all go with them yeah man that, that way you know you don't abandon ship yeah. what what uh you know so this gig tomorrow man with macy and with billy gibbons yeah. how are you how are you doing that so you get you're taking care of the person that's uh up front you, you, you had a rehearsal yesterday you said we had a rehearsal yes but without billy or because billy was flying in and macy was we're going to do a sound check with it tomorrow. Okay. We got the song down. We're doing, um, <clears throat> nah, I'd be a surprise actually. It's, it's okay. two with Macy, two covers. Okay. And Billy is, is three ZZ songs. Oh, sweet. I can't tell which one, but uh, some really good tunes. I mean, classic. Yeah. He's just, just a knucklehead to be around. Yeah. Because well, you've done a bunch of other gigs with him before, <laughs> right? Private shows with him. Yeah. Uh, with Kenny Anoff or with Matt Sorum. Right. These, these one offs or. Uh, corporate gigs or something, guitar legends. We do we do every year with Kenny, right. uh, and Billy's a host. Oh, and really? It's really awesome. Again, it's just nice to be, you know, have those great guitar players in front of you. Yeah. They do. Well, they yeah. say the same thing about you, I'm sure, man, because you know you've got. I'm, oh, really I'm making it easy for them, you know. Yeah. It's look good for them, but that's my gig. Uh, I, it's like so some of the europeans are camping they go okay guys i gotta go to sleep now <laughs> look at these but uh but but but, but mingo is like man full pack full package human is what uh, mingo says and robert weather robert weatherby team player you know i um i think uh you know i so I, i've now put you in that uh that category of bucket list must step on stage with you one day man so I, I I want to man. I I think um here's the here's the plan. My uh my ultimate goal. So we get rid of the COVID thing, and uh, I run down. I get my my baked potato promised me by Katja Reikerman, and uh, we hang out. We watch uh, some homies play, and uh, and then you and I just go go up and uh, take a little rhythm jam for a little bit. And then Eddie Martinez jumps in, and we uh we make, we slay. That'll happen in Portland. I'm gonna come up with one of those gigs that he's gonna be doing when it gets all clear. I'm gonna come up and actually do it. I, I I'll I'll make sure that Tal just like stubs his toe for just an hour, and <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun, man. I really would love to see you here, and I I can't tell you how great it is to share some energy with you, man. I uh I really I I like I I think uh having watched social media is funny, right, man? I mean, people can get hung up on all the negativity from social media, but I scan it, I limit my time on it, and there are very few people that I feel like. I can resonate with everything that person posts, man. And that's what first attracted me to reach out to you beside what Eddie been telling me about for years. And, uh, and the fact that it's exactly what I'd hoped for and more, man, is a, it's a great, great thing, man. So don't forget that. <laughs> oh, the, oh, you know what? So I, yeah, I have somebody uh, trying to, to uh, hook me up with a, a Canadian citizen so I can get out of the U S right now. She, uh, Carmela Long has been a wonderful singer. She's singing with Glass Tiger. Yes, and uh, actually, we opened up for them, or they opened up for us with Julian Lennon. Okay, get, so if you saw Carmela, she's an incredible singer, and we we did shows with Glass Tiger, and I sat side stage thinking, my God, that girl can slay, 
And, uh, and so now this guy's trying to wingman me, you know, to uh, <laughs> hook get me up. Together. Get us together. You know? yeah, yeah. But that's all good, man. This, uh, it's really, um, you know what? I just, I gotta say, I, I invited Eddie to jump in earlier. He's got another obligation, but I think something is really special about this, um, this composite of musicians, man. And I, I, you know, bless Aronoff and Billy Gibbons and Matt Soren for getting to, to rock with you, you know, and I think, uh, and Eddie Martinez and Tal, all these guys, they're very fortunate, but uh, I, I think I want to thank your mom for raising a decent human being, man. So, so give her some props from me. My mom and, and my girl. Yeah, and you're great. Yeah, yeah. She, I got to talk to her briefly before we got started. So thank her for helping get the set up. I, uh, she's man, machine gun wear and she's ready to go. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I want you to have a great time tomorrow, man. I'm envious that you're on stage, but I'm I'm glad that you're doing a really good thing. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's music care. It's really important to give back. Again, it's about giving back. Yeah, man. Um, so. That uh, the Detour Music Festival again. Uh, all proceeds go to Neva and Music Cares Foundation. They go to www.morrisonhotelgallery.com. They uh, that's where you can do all the uh, contributions to Music Cares and also stream the YouTube link. I watch all this on YouTube tomorrow. How do we get you? Um, Matt called up. Matt called up, and Billy wanted to do something different. And he's very finicky about players that play with him because you really. You got to you got to respect the ZZ stuff. You yeah. Can't oh yeah. Pop and you know you're crazy baseball. He knows <laughs> right. how, he knows how I adapt to whatever it is going to go on. Yeah. And uh, and I'm just a big fan of Billy. And so nice. Matt, Billy wants you to do it. I said I'm in. Nice. Great. It'd be the first time actually doing something physical live. I mean, last time was March March 12th. So last time I, we did a Bowie celebration tour, and we ended up in Portland. You that did. That's right. Yeah, I had a lot of friends that were there. My yeah. pal Mike Collins was seeing you. Yeah, that was a great night too. And then we went to Seattle, and then from there we had to disband. Oh man, it's great that you got in while you could. You know, great it's venue. a what's that? Awesome venue, but I, I just can't think of the name of Revolution it. Hall. Man, what a great place! It's, it's a good one, man. It was a it converted high school into a beautiful auditorium. Yeah, that that yeah, good friends of mine own that. Uh, Jim Brunberg, man. Yeah. Right now, Portland has done a lot to try and save the venues because, as we know. Most venues at that level, you know, from like thousand seaters to two thousand seaters, whatever, are really struggling. You know, every venue really. Every venue across the country. Yeah. But I have to say, this is a great gig for you. This. This is a great gig for you. Thank you. Very natural doing this, besides doing what you do playing wise, but this is this is another you got you got another outlet here, brother. Ah, uh, I appreciate that, man. I, you know what, I, I'm very fortunate that somehow I've really connected with wonderful people on the road. Um, we're getting close to episode hundred. I've done like 96 episodes in a hundred days. And I, um, I didn't expect to do it every day. And I'm going to taper off a little bit to do like three episodes a week, but I love doing it. And uh, you know, I welcome any sponsors that want to be uh, be a part of helping get this going. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, while we're waiting to gig, man, this is a nice way to uh, reconnect with people. Get some stuff on your wall back there. It looks like you're in the basement somewhere. <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at Rock and Roll Ralph's on Sunset, man. You know, the, <laughs> I'm in the alleyway behind it. When you know, out. <laughs> yeah, I do feel like I'm in the hole. Hey, um, you know, folks, if you're here and you've not uh, seen, I would love it if you would subscribe to this channel because I do have really cool guests coming on. Uh, you know, I'm not not all of them are as amazing as Carmine Rojas, but um, I've you? got some really fun ones, man. I really do. And I, uh, um, if you wouldn't mind, just subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, you'll get all the updates on these great shows. And then how can somebody get a hold of Carmen Rojas so that we can follow your socials besides Facebook? Well, actually, you know, cause I'm not a big Twitter guy. Actually, yeah. I'm not, I just, I'm old fashioned, old school. Facebook, Carmen Rojas fans. Okay. Or Carmen Rojas. Okay. Careful, cause there is another one out there. That's not real. You could tell by the amount of people that's not on there. So yeah, that can be and, uh, only one. Five thousand uh, Carmen Rojas fans is the real one. The Carmen, yeah, Carmen Rojas fans is the one. That's the only one that's open right now that you okay. can find and see all the shenanigans. I love it. You know what? I'll yeah. I'll archive this on my website. I'll make sure that that link to that fans page is out there, and I'll also link over to this event so that people can uh, check out your show tomorrow. I'm really grateful for you being here, man, and I hope you have a great show tomorrow. Thank you. We will. We will. It's going to be interesting. It's just going to, it's just weird playing. No audience. It's just us. In the yeah. Room. 
So it's just going to us, us blasting out the door, you know? And, uh, well, you're in good company, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you got your yeah, man, Macy Gray and uh, Billy Gibbons, my God, and Matt Sorum, you know, good stuff all the way around. Again, the combination, again, it's great to do, being able to play that or this. Yeah. It's important that the, the versatility is important to be versatile in music, your music abilities. Yeah. Rural music too, which is a whole nother other side of myself, flamenco and African and Latin or whatever, world music, come, you know, I, I mix it all together in one big pot, so. Yeah, that's what, they, what you called it, the Puerto Rican sh- Smorgasbord. That's right. That's right. You gotta. You bet. You better patent, like patent that right now, man. Trademark it. It's the pr pr smorgasbord dot com. Hey. <laughs> hey, man. Thank you so much, Carmine Rojas. Thank you guys all for being here. I really appreciate it. Everybody that everybody that's been here on the chat. It's amazing to see how supportive you've got all these people here. And uh, man, Carmine. If you guys in Europe, please go go. go. Get some sleep. Now that this is over, you can go to bed, man. Yeah. Hey, Carmine, thank you so much, my friend. I adore you. You're a wonderful human being. Stay healthy and uh, and rock the show tomorrow night. Can't wait to hear how it goes. You got it, brother. Am I love to Eddie? You see, if you see him. You got it, buddy. I will do. Hey, Thanks, guys. amigo. Thanks. All right. Take care.